Moving over to Kubernetes from VMs or even just regular containers may have you questioning the ability to run stateful workloads. Where's my storage? How can I make sure that storage behind a container persists when the container goes down or when it gets rescheduled? In this video, we'll take a quick look at storage in Kubernetes and try to demystify a few of the terms. So when it comes to Kubernetes storage, there's a couple of things we have to cover. Uh, we got to start out with volumes, storage classes, persistent volumes, persistent volume claims. Then we're going to look at best practices and popular options. You've probably heard of the idea of a volume. You've probably seen some information around storage classes. You've probably heard of persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. These are the PVs and PVCs, but what's the difference? Let's start out with volumes. This is just the default volume that comes with a container. It's ephemeral. If the container crashes, the state's not saved. It's challenging to set up and access a shared file system across all the containers in a deployment because each pod has their own storage. Let's talk about storage classes. A storage class is a way to describe different classes of storage. You can describe a quality of service level, a backup policy, and any other policy that you want to, like something like maybe a SSD versus an HD or something that is cheap for you to, to give to your users versus something that's very expensive to give to your users. There's some built-in options for storage classes like config maps, local, host path, and more. These are some of the common things that come with Kubernetes, but most of the things that you're actually gonna see are using the container storage interface. So stuff that you see from cloud and vendors are gonna be in here. And here's a list of the drivers for different CSIs that you could use. This is probably what you're gonna see if you're using storage through a cloud vendor or if you have like another vendor option that you're using. Persistent volumes, the name says it all. They persist, although it depends on your delete policy that you're using for these persistent volumes. It abstracts away the actual storage behind the scenes. It's a resource and it can be created through the Kubernetes API and its life cycle is independent of pods. What does that mean? That means that you can have a persistent volume exist after a pod or deployment has been deleted. So these don't necessarily have to be part of the pod. They can get created before, they can get created after and attached. There's all kinds of things that you can do with persistent volumes. What is a persistent volume claim? It is a user request that claims a persistent volume. So the volume could be pre-provisioned or provisioned on demand. More than likely you're gonna see provisioned on demand instead of pre-provisioned volumes. Although there may be use cases where having a pre-provisioned volume is helpful. So what would this look like in the CLI? You would see your persistent volume and it wouldn't be claimed or bound or anything like that. It's available. What you would do is you would create a volume claim, claiming that volume, and then you would attach that to your pod. So this is where you define access modes and define storage size requests and all of that. So use cases, anything that requires persistent storage, you probably want to set something like this up. Databases, state-based applications, file sharing, machine learning, anything. Anything where you want the storage to exist, you're probably going to set up a storage class and you're gonna, you're gonna use persistent volumes instead of just using the base volume that comes with a container on its local file storage. So what are some best practices? So use dynamic provisioning with quotas to avoid PV sitting around unused. So depending on your use case, you're more than likely, like I said, gonna you're gonna use dynamic provisioning. When a user wants storage, they're gonna go in, they're gonna request it, and it's gonna come up and it's it's gonna access it through the storage class. You wanna educate your users on reclaim policies. So if you wanna have PVs independent of pods, you want them to stick around so that they can be reused for something, you wanna make sure that those aren't deleted when the pod is deleted. It's also good to make sure that if users don't need the storage after they deleted the pod, that they're deleting the storage so that you don't have all of these, you don't have all of these persistent volumes just sitting around unused, which, which could cost you a good amount of money if you're using a, a cloud provider and you just have storage sitting around that's not used. Use meaningful names for the storage class so that users know what they're requesting. This is good because if you have a user that wants a certain speed of storage, you can provide that to them. Like if they want SSDs over just slow storage, or if they just don't care, maybe they'll use the cheapest option. So you could have storage speed or you could have costs or something associated with it to let the user know hey, this is cheap storage. You can use as much as you want of this. This is expensive. Maybe you want to only use this if it's really needed. So some popular storage options are Portworks, Rook, Longhorn, and your cloud provider. You're probably going to see a CSI from your cloud provider that you could use so you can actually access it like EKS and, and different things like that. Um, if you want to look into different projects, you've got Portworks, which is a great storage provider option. Uh, you've got Rook, which will deploy Ceph for you and other things. You've got Longhorn. Um, there's a bunch of options out there. These are just some of the popular ones that I pulled up that are that are available. So what does this look like on the command line? Well, let's go ahead and take a look. So for the default K3S storage class, you're going to have local path. And as you can see, this is the default. What we're going to do is we're going to create a PVC using that default. And if we look at the PVC YAML, we can see that we're using the storage class name local path. Access mode, read, write once, and the storage is two gigs. And what we want to do now is create a pod so that it'll go ahead and attach that storage somewhere. So in the pod, you can see that the spec looks normal. What you, what you see at the bottom is volumes. We're naming the volume and we're saying persistent volume claim. We want to use the claim name local path PVC. And that information is used in the PVC itself as the name as well in the namespace default. So we're telling it go use this and then attach it 
it to this disk. And then the mount path is actually going to be uh, data. And then after that, what we can do is we can take a look and get the PV to show that it's bound. So this is actual persistent volume and it shows which persistent volume claim is using it too. And then what we can do is we can get the PVC, which is the claim, and we can show that that's bound and it shows the access mode storage class and information about that. We can describe it to see a little bit more information about it. And then we can also describe the PV after that to see a little bit more information about that. But this is pretty much what it looks like. It just kind of abstracts away what the storage is behind the scenes, and it just gives your users a way to use the Kubernetes API to attach storage to their pods, deployments, anything. Thank you for checking out this video. This is just a quick description of some of the ideas around storage and Kubernetes. If you want to learn more, there's a blog post in the description that actually goes into each of these a little bit deeper. And if you want to learn about how to use something like this with vCluster, we've got a great webinar talking about port works. You can watch that. It should be up here somewhere. Um, you can go ahead and click that and watch that next. But uh, if you like this kind of content and you want to see more of it, uh, give us some comments. Let us know what you want to see next. Uh, like, subscribe, any of that. We we'll try to put some videos out like once a week and try to provide information about Kubernetes, vCluster, and how they all work together. Uh, thank you so much and bye.